Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to begin the last session. If we can draw your attention away from the lovely weather outside. I'm Fred Dilla. I'm the executive director of the American Institute of Physics. I'm honored to chair this last session. I know it's tough competition discussing open access, public access policies compared to watching that beautiful golf course out there. But I want to thank the organizers for um, this turn of the weather. Uh, it makes me feel at home for an Indian summer in Washington. I'm going to invoke summer rules. So those of you who have jackets, please shed them, loosen your ties, loosen whatever, and get comfortable. Uh, we have before you a very interesting set of talks for what is typically very dry policy stuff. But you're all well aware of how much time we spend at ALPS events, at other publishing trade associations, when we're invited to library association meetings, when we're out talking to our, our university uh, colleagues about the issue of open access as a business model, public access as public policy. We spent a tremendous amount of time talking and trying to do something about this in a way that sustains our enterprise, sustains what publishing brings to the scholarly community. Bit of discussion of that this morning on our message. Our message is not out because they're very nice sound bites out there. Oh, the government paid for the research. The public should be able to see it. Maybe they pay for it several times. These are hard sound bites to deal with because we often, as publishers, as you heard this morning, trip into a five or 10 minute speech about XML and tagging and all the rest. And we lose them very quickly. We have two very important audiences in dealing with public access policy. One are our stakeholders, our subscribers, our subscribing institutions, our authors who are also our readers. But we also have policymakers in the government institutions that fund the research that ends up being expressed in an article that we invest, pick a number, one to four thousand dollars typically for the finished product that we put up on multiple platforms archive forever, remember, forever, from issue one as the platforms and the languages and the tools change on the time scale of 18 months. That's the message we have to get in front of our government agency folks who pay for the research so that they don't put in place policies that are just plainly ill thought or, or stupid. Stupid in the sense that it could damage the very product that they're trying to make more widely accessible than it is. So what we have brought for you for the afternoon's discussion is an international view of how a number of people in your community have dealt with three governments. We're going to start with the situation here in the UK. We'll move to the European Union, and then I'll come back and summarize the situation in the US. They're all very fluid. They've changed quite a bit from the time that we submitted these summary abstracts for the brochure you have. And so you'll get a very up-to-date uh, presentation uh, if you want some of the details that we won't say on camera, come to us um, tonight. So uh, our first speaker is a good friend and colleague, Steve Hall. He's the managing director of the Institute of Physics Publishing, a uh, wonderful organization that I compete with and I collaborate with as another physics publisher. And uh, I'm proud to call Steve a very good friend and close colleague. We also shared the board on 
board's positions on the current board of the SDM Association. And Steve was a principal and is still a principal in the Finch Group. And there was quite a bit of uh, news about the Finch Group earlier this week, which he will tell you about. But he'll tell you the whole story from um, start to present engagement with all of the Finch Group stakeholders. Steve? Thank you, Fred. If it were only the whole story from start to finish. <laughs> So let me start by saying how um, extraordinarily prescient it was of the organisers to schedule this uh, session today uh, in a week in which our House of Commons Biz Select Committee has reported on open access. And I will try and incorporate their views on um, open access and what the UK should be doing um, into this presentation which was written before, um, uh, before um, uh, uh, the, the uh, report came out. So what I'd like to cover briefly is, is what drove the thinking of the Finch Group and the recommendations that we came up with just over a year ago, um, how government in the UK responded to the Finch recommendations, how the policy that came out of that has subsequently been implemented by funders, universities and publishers, and what we've learned so far and what we might see next. So these were the um, eight success criteria that we established at the beginning of the Finch process. The first three are all about access. Only the first one of these is really subject to UK policy, given that the other two are about uh, publications from outside the UK. Um, there was some wishful thinking throughout the Finch process on the part of uh, some stakeholders that where the UK led, the rest of the world would follow, uh, which we're not really seeing happening yet. The next three are all about cost and sustainability, and it's the first one of those, the financial sustainability for publishers, that so sticks in the throats of some of our opponents and which very clearly influenced that biz committee report. And then the last two are about maintaining quality during changing business models. So there were 10 recommendations from Finch, and I've highlighted on this slide what I believe are the two most important ones. The first one was setting a direction of travel towards gold open access. Why did we choose that? Because we decided that gold is better than green on the basis that it gives immediate access to the version of record with pretty broad rights of reuse whereas green gives delayed access, not to the version of record, but to some other version, without rights of reuse or with inferior rights of reuse. It seemed to us on that basis, gold was the better option if we were going to move to an open access world. But green would clearly play a, an important complementary role during that transition to gold, because we weren't going to have an overnight transition to gold. But the Finch Group was very clear that if we were going to have green on a greater scale than we have it today, then embargo periods on green in the absence of funding for gold should not be shorter than 12 months. And it's worth saying here, because it's very often forgotten by some, that all the stakeholders on Finch, the funders, that is Wellcome, RCUK, and Hefke, and the libraries, and the university administrators, and the learned societies, and the publishers, all the stakeholders on Finch, endorsed the final report from Finch with these recommendations in it. Some of them rather easily forget that today. So when the business committee report calls for RCUK to return to its initial six-month embargo, it's forgetting that RCUK previously signed up to 12 um, under the Finch, in the Finch report, as part of the balanced package that Finch delivered. There are another number of recommendations, the first of these being very important, this one about putting in place better mechanisms for the funding of gold. We did this very deliberately 
RCUK has for many years had a policy of funding gold through the grants it provides to researchers for their research. But Finch and others have recognized that this wasn't working. The, grant, the funding could only be used during the lifetime of the grant. Most publication happens after the end of the grant period. The result, most researchers, even if they wanted to, could not use their research grants to fund gold. So again, when the business committee calls for RCUK to go back to funding gold through grants, it's missed the reason we made that recommendation and the reason that RCUK changed how it funds uh, gold. It also called for minimal restrictions on reuse. We did not call when Finch explicitly for CC BY as RCUK is requiring, but we did call for relatively broad um, rights of reuse under gold. And the last two recommendations there in relation to licensing are really a recognition of the fact that only 6% of global research comes from the UK and the other 94% cannot be made accessible under open access through UK government policy. The only way we could extend access in the UK to overseas content is through extending licensing. And then there were a number of other proposals we made on access in public libraries, which I'll talk about a little later, about balancing APC income against subscription income. What we were saying here is that publishers should not be double dipping. We shouldn't be charging an author to publish and then charging a library to have access to that paper through a subscription journal. We weren't suggesting there should be a direct offsetting in the UK of what libraries pay in or institutions pay in APCs against what that institution pays in subscriptions. Um, some are interpreting it that way, and I'll come back again to that later. Uh, the final uh, recommendation on monographs was largely to do with the fact that Finch excluded monographs from its remit. We thought that in the time we had available to us, journals would pretty much, journals and conference proceedings, would pretty much uh, fill our time, and that turned out to be the case. So those were the recommendations. And a month after they were published in June uh, 2012, in July 2012, uh, the government uh, published its response to them. And the government broadly accepted the recommendations we made. It supported the idea of a transition over a period of time from the subscription model to a gold open access model with green playing a role during that transition period. It accepted in principle that if we did that in the UK, there would be additional costs to the UK. We would be paying to provide access to UK research outputs to the rest of the world before the rest of the world was doing the same for us. It accepted that in principle. Unfortunately, it also made clear it wouldn't provide any additional funding to help with that. And some of the problems we've had in implementation in the last year have been to do with that absence of additional funding. Again, I'll come back to that later. The government, and David Willits himself, was also very clear that embargoes should not be shorter than 12 months, that we as publishers must have time to earn back our investment in a, a paper before that paper becomes freely available. It also supported, in principle, the idea of licensing extensions, but again, without any funding. And it loved the idea of the free access in public libraries because it was going to be free. It wasn't going to cost anything, and potentially it does extend access to um, unaffiliated researchers who cannot easily get access through, say, a university library. So a favorable, favorable response from government to um, uh, to the Finch recommendations. To help with the understanding of the Finch recommendations, we produce this decision tree. In fact, um, I think the author, Ian Bannerman, is in the audience. So it's widely regarded as or called the PA decision tree. In fact, it's a TNF decision tree adopted by the Publishers Association and subsequently endorsed by both government and the research councils. The purpose of this tree was really to say two things. First, government and RCUK's preference is for gold, at least in the original 
um, iteration of RCUK policy. But it says another important thing, which is where there's no funding for gold, that it's unacceptable to have an embargo period of less than 12 months. What this did was to reflect the critical compromise of the Finch Working Group. Publishers and all other stakeholders would give active support for a transition to gold open access over a period of time. In return, there would be no short embargoes on green where there was no funding for gold. It's the, the quid pro quo, if you like, of support for gold, no short embargoes. Again, it's important to say all stakeholders accepted this. The Biz Committee report, published earlier this week, says that RCUK should abandon this decision tree because it no longer reflects RCUK policy. And it's true that RCUK policy has changed somewhat in that it's a little more neutral between gold and green. And I'll come back to that later. But if we abandon this, and I'm sure there are some who would like to see it abandoned, we lose that critical requirement that there be no short embargoes in the absence of funding for gold. And the Biz Committee either failed to understand that or much more likely deliberately um, ignored it. Universities have come up with their own decision trees and we'll take a look at one of those a little later. So let's look at implementation by funders, starting with RCUK. RCUK's implementation got off to a very bad start indeed. It published its policy on the same day that government published its policy, which suggests that it didn't take very long, if any time at all, to understand government policy before um, uh, writing its own on the back of government policy. It didn't either consult with any of the other stakeholders who'd been involved in the Finch process. It didn't talk to publishers at all, but moreover, it didn't talk to the universities. And the first iteration of its policy published in July last year required the universities to pay 20% of the cost of gold, with no consultation. Not surprisingly, the universities were not so keen on that, to the point where in a meeting in December last year that I happened to attend, uh, the RCUK policy was called a policy implementation, was called a car crash. And I should say it wasn't a publisher who said that, but the PVCR of one of our biggest research intensive universities. It was partly this lack of engagement with the other stakeholders, and particularly the universities, who were bearing the lion's share, if you like, of implementation work, but also a real lack of clar clarity, a, a good deal of ambiguity, some of it deliberate at the beginning, in the RCUK policy, uh, partly designed to have researchers think that short embargoes were acceptable, which is why we get these two comments from the House of Lords Science and Technology Committee, which looked at implementation of government policy in January and February this year. Again, just coming back to the House of Commons Biz Committee report published this week, what that has done is to go back and look at policy itself. It's not looked at implementation. It is trying to rewrite policy. But we've made a lot of progress since then. We've moved on. We've had several further iterations of the RCUK policy um, to the current version, which was published on the 8th of April, so about a week into the, the new mandate. There are a number of key changes in that policy from the first iteration of it. The first is there's no requirement on the universities to put in 20% of the funding. So, uh, in fact, RCUK is effectively saying to the universities, we don't really mind how you spend the money as long as you, sp as long as you spend it in the pursuit of open access. The second, is a, the second change is a greater neutrality between gold and green, recognizing that there, is, there isn't anywhere near sufficient funding right now for all papers to be published gold. What the research councils have said to the universities is, look, we're in the early days. 
If green suits you better, use green. If gold suits you better, use gold. And the third major change, and one that's very important to publishers, is that there isn't any longer uh, an explicit attempt to impose a six-month embargo where green comes into play. The research councils have accepted that, at least during this transition period, when there's inadequate funding to support gold, that green embargoes can be 12 months in STM and 24 in uh, humanities and social sciences. So three major changes which have made the whole policy much more pragmatic and practical and implementable. We're looking at a five-year transition period through to the 2017-18 academic year, at the end of which, in theory, there will be sufficient funding for gold. There are some questions over this. In year one, in theory, there's funding for 45% of RCUK-funded papers to be published gold. But that's the old number when the universities were required to put 20% in. So in fact, it's probably 36% this year, using the average APC values that Finch used for its modeling. And that 75% in year five, if the universities continue to put more, no money in, which is very likely, we're really talking about 60%. So we're talking still about a relatively um, partial um, move to gold over the five years of the transition. There's no agreement yet on what license should be used for green. Uh, the research councils are attempting to require us to use CC by NC. There are discussions going on between publishers and the research councils and others. I don't think they've made very much progress so far. If we then look at implementation by HEFKE, which will come in next year, and which will affect far, far more papers than the research council policy, only about 20% of uh, research papers published by UK authors are research council funded. Um, the new policy from HEFKE looks likely to be a primarily green policy. When HEFKE did a sort of consultation earlier this year, it was suggesting it was neutral between gold and green, though it made very clear it would provide no additional funding for gold. It expected the universities to fund any gold out of their QR uh, grants. In the consultation that's going through now, running till the end of October, and I suggest as many of you as possible respond to that consultation, it's really a green policy. It's about green open access, about deposit in an institutional repository or sometimes in a subject repository, about deposit of the accepted manuscript rather than necessarily the version of record, but it is demanding relatively broad rights of reuse. It's notable that the when the uh, business Committee report was published earlier this week. Within minutes, Hefke had its response to that report up on the website, and it very much welcomed it. And I think we can expect to see Hefke trying to use the BizCom report to justify six-month green embargoes with no funding for gold, which is why it's important, if we disagree with that, we should be responding to the consultation. And moving on to the universities. Um, it's very clear that this is very much still a work in progress. Um, policies are still evolving, guidance is changing on university websites. I happened to have a meeting with half a dozen Russell Group universities in late July, um, uh, at which they were trying to persuade me we should fully offset APCs against license fees. And in advance of the meeting, I looked at each of their websites, their instructions to their researchers on open access, and most of them were nowhere near compliant with the revised RCUK policy. Uh, and I mentioned this to them, and they were somewhat surprised. I went back and looked at their websites um, a week ago or so ago in preparation for today's session. Most of them have changed their website instructions to their authors to be much more closely compliant with the current version of RCUK policy. So that's over just over a month they had made those changes. There's no consistent policy from the universities, but most of them are explicitly pushing their authors towards green rather than towards gold. And the majority of those who are pushing their authors towards green are doing so with a 12 or 24 month embargo, not a six or 12 month embargo. So they are compliant 
with the revised RCUK policy and with Finch and with government. There are a few who are pushing their authors towards green, very strongly towards green, who are saying to their authors, the embargo period is six months. They're wrong, and in the Finch review, the one-year Finch review that's happening in a couple of weeks, I hope we'll be able to address that. A very few, like UCL, are supplementing their block grant from RCUK with additional funding of their own, though it's no surprise that demand for gold at the moment appears relatively low, given that most universities are pushing their researchers towards green. There's a very small minority that are favoring gold over green. Exeter's an interesting one. It says on its website, RCUK's preference is for gold, ours is for green, and kind of leaves the author to make up his or her own mind as to which they'll do. But in general, what we're seeing from the universities in a relatively short time into this process is a pragmatic and practical approach that I think publishers generally can work with. This is Oxford's decision tree. Um, as you'll see, it's rather different to the PA decision tree in that you choose your journal and you go green. You don't go gold. Gold becomes a kind of last resort. Um, it doesn't say it on this um, diagram, but it says it in the written guidance that goes with it that the embargo period under that first green option is six months. They're wrong, and we need to change that. This is the rewriting of policy that the business committee would like to see. It's important, therefore, that we try and change this and a few other universities in the way they're implementing their policy. So why are the universities going green? That's a simple answer. They're desperately concerned over cost. Um, they don't want to create a huge demand among their researchers for gold, which they can't then meet. So they're dampening down that gold demand by pushing them first towards green. It's not surprising. Um, at IOP, we looked at our UK customers and looked what they would need to spend with us to publish all of the papers they currently publish with us on a gold basis rather than a subscription basis. For one of them, they would spend four times as much with us as they currently spend on their license and subscription fees to publish their institution's papers with us on a gold basis. And of course, those license and subscription fees are not going to go away because UK content only represents about 6% of what we publish they're going to continue to have to pay for the other 94%. So you can see why, with limited funding, and in the very early days of this policy, they're very nervous and are therefore being very cautious. But they also lack data. Most of them don't know how many RCUK-funded papers they put they, their authors produce each year. There is very little data to support decision-making by them. And then, leaving aside the cost issues, they're also still looking at other policy issues. Who funds a paper jointly published by two authors from two different UK institutions? Who funds a paper jointly published by two authors, one from a UK institution and one from a German institution? How do you manage payments? How do you monitor compliance? Most of them seem to feel they can man monitor gold compliance because, after all, they're paying a fee. They've got a record of that. Monitoring green is going to be close to impossible, especially when there's a certain ambiguity as to whether you're compliant with a six or 12 month embargo or a 12 or 24 month embargo. So there are some real challenges for the universities there and we can understand why they're taking the, the relatively slow approach that they're doing. So a few words about Sherpa Fact. I think Alps has briefed members on it um, fairly extensively. This is a day, it's a, another Sherpa database at the University of Nottingham, funded by the RC and UK and Wellcome to um, tell an author whether a journal is it's compliant with Wellcome or RC UK open access policy. It would be nice to think of it as a one-stop shop where an author could go, find out whether the journal's compliant, what the APC is, and so on and so forth. It's not that. In fact, it's some way from it at the moment. It doesn't have anything like reliable data in it on APC charges for specific journals. 
gives indicative data for some, but that's really not helpful. And it cannot be accurate on archiving periods, on embargo periods, because it does not collect journal-level data on that. It collects publisher-level data. And for any publisher who publishes on behalf of perhaps a number of partners, there are going to be different rules in place for different journals. We're trying to work with Sherpa on this. There was an idea floated at a meeting on Monday that publishers might want to put some money into this. That might not be a bad idea for us to look at collectively if it would help to ensure, one, we have a say in its development, and two, that the data are accurate. So how are we doing? Well, on some measures, you could say that we're more compliant with RCUK policy than most other stakeholders. Most of us are now offering gold options on our journals, hybrid options. Most of us, I think, are offering a CC BY license for gold if RCUK or Wellcome funding is involved. Clearly, there are considerable reservations about that, and I understand them being much stronger in humanities and social sciences than in, in, in my discipline of physics. Um, a few publishers are compliant with a six-month embargo, regardless of funding for gold. Work is going on on the Public Library Initiative. Um, I don't know if you all know what the Public Library Initiative is, but it's, it, it, it came out of Finch, the offer to provide free on-site access in UK public libraries to scholarly journals. Not remote access, on-site access. Um, we were asked as an industry to come up with what Biz called a, a grand gesture. Um, I nearly did, but a different one to what they wanted. Um, and, but the grand gesture we came up with, and if you don't like it, I'm the one to blame because it was my proposal, um, <coughs> was to provide this free on-site access in public libraries so that unaffiliated researchers or that mother with a sick child could go and look up, look up the literature in the library and print off and take away copies. We had the technical launch of that this week. The proper pilot will launch go public and so on in December. So we're fulfilling our um, side of that bargain. Double dipping, I don't think we've quite addressed yet, but I'll come back to that in a moment. I, I know I've got to finish quite quickly. <laughs> so what have we learned? Well, RCUK has taken to, taken to calling this uh, process a, a journey, not an event. Well, we know that the policy needs to reflect wh where we are on that journey and not the end point. I think that was the original mistake that RCUK made. Universities don't want the additional cost. Researchers are still somewhat skeptical about being required to publish open access. Um, we've learned that through multiple meetings with researchers over the last um, six or nine months. We need much closer consultation between the different stakeholders to make this work. I think we also need some consistent communications between ourselves and the universities and the funders so that authors are getting a single message rather than multiple messages in different languages. We as publishers need to address this double dipping issue. There's an argument being developed among some that the RCUK policy is being stymied by us double dipping. There are two sides to this. There's the one side of whether we're really taking APCs and not reducing subscription prices at all. If we're doing that, we're utterly stupid to do it because all it's doing is providing fuel for the fire um, against, against publishers. Then there's the more complex one of how that avoidance of double dipping <laughs> be achieved, whether through reductions in global subscription prices or local offsetting, which seems to me very difficult to achieve. Um, if you want to go to the slides later when they're up on the ARPS website, I've provided some links. Um, what I'd like to leave you with is this thought. Um, we were heading a year ago in a direction of gold. Uh, I think now it's a bit more ambiguous. Um, uh, Fred and I came across this window above a florist shop in Copenhagen when we were there for the STM board meeting, and both of us just thought it was absolutely perfect in describing where we are with um, open access implementation in the UK. Um, it, it's a quote from a Robert Frost uh, poem, which I haven't got time to read you now. Thank you. <laughs>